I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken for the week. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. I have a very special guest this week, Mr. Jack Neary. And Jack used to write for the uh, Bodybuilding Magazine's Muscle Builder Magazine with Joe Weider back in the day when I was growing up. So, uh, Jack, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, John. I'm really honored to be asked. And uh, I think you're doing a great thing with this podcast. It's nice to capture some of the memories of the guys who lived in the golden days. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, really happy to be included in that group. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you joining me. Well, uh, Jack, let's start from the beginning. How did you get into writing? How did you get into eventually working for Joe Weider? Well, um, I, I was, um, I had taken up weight training as a teenager when I was playing high school football okay. uh, in Calgary, Alberta, which is in the west side of Canada. And, uh, you know, I just gravitated towards Muscle Builder and Power magazine on the newsstands. I mm -hmm. uh, started reading it religiously um, it was captivated by the world painted by luminary writers at the time of, you know, Dick Tyler, Rick Wayne, mm -hmm. Armand Canny, Gene Mose, all those guys um, was really caught up in that, in the scene that they recreated for me, uh, the California scene. Yeah. Um, of course, when you, when you look back at what bodybuilding was then uh, versus what it is today, you know, it, it didn't really enjoy the widespread popularity that it does now. Weight training was something that was kind of frowned on. Now, of course, athletes in every sport embrace weight training. Mm -hmm. You know, in those days, there was kind of it was kind of on the fringe. There was a knock against it. It made you muscle bound. All of those yeah. kind of myths. Yeah. Um, but it was a very small, insular world, and there was something very special about that. And I I became caught up in it just reading the the magazine through the Weeder publications. Uh, and the other, you know, Perry Raiders, Iron Man, and Dan Lurie's magazine, and all the different mags of the day. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually um, started as a sports writer on a daily newspaper in Calgary at a young age while I was still a teenager. Oh, wow. And um, so that I, that's how I got my start. I was a, a kind of a reporter for covering different sports uh, for the daily newspaper and uh, was training lifting weights on my own. And, you know, was just a real fan of bodybuilding was a huge Arnold fan and, mm -hmm. you know, all of the guys, Sergio Leave, all Franco, all the guys of that time. Right. And um, I, uh, I, I thought, you know what, I'd like to work for Joe. I think I could write for this guy. Um, <laughs> and so I actually put together a, a letter of introduction. You know, I'm just 20 years old at the time. And I included a bunch of cuttings of, of sports articles that I'd written from the daily newspaper. And I sent them off to Joe and I never really expected to get a reply. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard after the fact that uh, it was Rick Wayne who was working with Joe and, and saw these clippings and said to Joe, wow, this kid can really write. Uh, you should bring him down for an interview to California. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was I was stunned. About a week later, I got a call out of the blue from Joe's secretary, a woman, a German woman named Annalisa. I'll never forget her. And um, she said, Mr. Weeder was really impressed by your package and would like you to fly down and meet him. Wow. I, I couldn't believe this. You know, I was yeah. absolutely knocked onto my ass. You know, this was crazy. And right. so, so she made the arrangements and, and I flew down and, and I arrived at the Woodland Hills, Hills, Hills Temple there, yeah. Weeder Health and Fitness. And I'm sure you've been there. And uh, I was waiting in the lobby, very nervous, sweaty palms, the whole thing. I was yeah. going to, you know, one of the giants of the of the business, Joe Weeder. Um, and, I, you know, if you remember the lobby, it had this kind of grand spiral staircase that swept right. down from the editorial offices down into the lobby. And there were these enormous, larger than life, full body uh, oil painting portraits of, of, of some of the greats of the time, Arnold, Larry Scott and Rick Wayne. Wow. Um, and it was like this pantheon of the gods. I was looking up and just in total awe. Right. And after a short wait, um, Joe, Joe Weider himself came striding down this, this great staircase. And of course, Joe at that time was no stranger putting himself, his own pictures in the magazine. He loved the publicity. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I had this impression of him as this very distinguished looking older guy in his mid 50s, you know, with the coiffed hair and the walrus mm-hmm. mustache. Um, and then, of course, he opened his mouth. And that's when the first big surprise came. It was his voice. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't at all what I expected. He, he said, right. hello, how are you? Did you have a good trip? And, and it was this high-pitched, crackling sort of voice that was really kind of unnerving to listen to. Not at all what I expected. Right. Um, and, of course, I learned later that everyone had a, who had met Joe had a Joe Weider imitation. Right. Arnold right. had a very good one. He was very good at imitating Joe. Um, so Joe said, would you like to go to lunch? And so we went into, he was driving a white Lincoln Continental Mark IV, a very grand car at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, he took me to this nearby restaurant. There was this really nice sunny courtyard. There was a waterfall and it was really pretty grand. And, you know, I'm just some punk kid from the prairies who, uh, you know, didn't know any better. And here here I was in in the the Mecca of, of bodybuilding and, um, and Joe said, do you want some artichokes? Um, and and I, I, I said, what? And he said, do you want some artichokes? And Joe loved artichokes. And, and I, as I said, I'm just this kid. I'd never had an artichoke in my life, let alone heard of one. Um, and so we had artichokes for lunch and a couple other things. And, and Joe asked me a bunch of questions about my work and my writing. And I, I guess I answered them satisfactorily. And um, he entertained me over lunch with stories of his growing up as this poor kid in the Jewish ghetto of Montreal. And he liked the fact that I was a fellow Canadian. I mean, I think that was a, oh, yeah. a little bit of a bond there, right. even though he'd been living in the States for many, many years. Yeah. But he, he would tell the stories of how he used to go down. He, he was very, very poor, uh, but he would go down to the old rail yard looking for scrap metal so he could make himself these makeshift barbells out of the wheels from the trains. And, you know, right. I, I can't imagine he actually lifted wheels from the trains because those are pretty heavy, but he right. said he did. Um, but, uh, you know, we went back to the office and, uh, he said, I'm going to give you a test assignment. Um, and it was, I want you to meet Franco Colombo and do an interview with him and do a story about his shoulder training routine. Hmm. Um, so, um, I, somebody drove me or I don't know how I got there, but I got to Franco's house. It was, a, it was a beautiful sunny day. It was in his backyard. He just actually qualified to become a chiropractor. So he was very, you know, proud of himself for that, and was a big deal in his life. Uh, he what was year married. Was Jack about seventy six. Uh, this was this was uh, uh, would have been May of of seventy six. Okay. Um, and forgive me if I get some of the dates wrong along the way here. I, it's you know it's like forty five years ago. Right, right. Some of the things are a little fuzzy, but uh, but I do remember certain landmark things. Um, and um, so I interviewed Franco. I had a little tape recorder. I interviewed him. He was very charming, very gracious, very generous with his time. Uh-huh. I met his wife, Anita, at the time, who also was a chiropractor. Right. And um, I flew back to Calgary the next day, and I worked on my story. Uh, and then I, I sent it back down to Joe. And I didn't hear anything for a while, and I got a little bit worried. Mm-hmm. Um, and I heard later that Joe really wasn't all that crazy about the story I wrote. I don't know if he, I just didn't like it that much, or I don't know what, but um, Rick kept bugging him, you know, you, no, no, he's good. He's a good writer. You should give him a shot, give him a shot. Mm-hmm. And um, so Joe ended up hiring me, obviously. And um, I didn't even have a car in those days. And I, I, I just got my driver's license and I bought an old Volvo, a, a car, and I drove down from Calgary, the 1700 miles to Los Angeles and wow. settled into this amazing new chapter in my life. Wow, um, and I, I really have to say I owe, owe a huge debt of gratitude to Rick, who who became a mentor for me, and uh-huh. we shared a tremendous passion and for writers, not just bodybuilding, but for the new journalism and you know yeah. great writers like Norman Mailer and Hunter S. Thompson, George Plimpton, guys like that. Uh, we were both great fans of that, and I think that formed a bond. And he kind of took me under his wing and showed me the ropes, and and so I settled into life down there and. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and of course that opened up a whole new avenue. I mean, I joined, I joined Gold's gym, um, which was the original one uh, that Joe Gold had started on Pacific Avenue. I think it was in in Venice. And, um, uh, although Joe didn't own the gym then it was owned by Ken Sprague at that time. Um, and, uh, and of course being a writer and editor for Weeder opened every door you could imagine. Yeah. And I met all of the top stars of the day. And I was struck by just how 
nice and open and, and generous all of these guys were to me. I mean, Arnold was so charming and giving and spent, I met, spent a lot of time with Arnold, became quite close to him in yeah. those early days. Franco, Frank Zane, Robbie Robinson, Ken Waller, Roger Callard. Uh, later, Lou Ferrigno came out west, Mike Menser, Cal Scholick, right. Eddie Giuliani, Danny Pitti, all, all the guys, you know. Wow. Um, I mean, it was a place that drew the, the big names of the time uh, to train at Golds. Not all of them moved there, but they would come for periods of time and train and then go back home, mm -hmm. back east or wherever they were from. Right. Um, but, you know, as I said, no one was more generous with this time and welcoming than Arnold himself. We became okay. wow. quite friendly. Mm -hmm. um, I feel free to interrupt and ask questions as we go if I'm rattling on here. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm glad you mentioned the writing because uh, that's what really got me into bodybuilding when I was a kid. I started when I was 14 in 1977. And I remember reading Rick. Rick was a fantastic writer. I remember reading your articles. And I really, the articles were so well written. And I, I miss the magazines today, of course. But what yeah. I really missed was those in-depth articles that you, you guys wrote. And uh, you really felt like you got to know the different personalities of these guys. And, you know, we didn't, we only got to see them if we went to the contest. So I remember I went to the Mr. Olympia in 1977. And when they get, when they came out, you felt like you knew everybody, you know, because yeah. you read all the articles and you knew all about their personalities, you know. Well, that, that's a, that's a great insight uh, into the, what we were trying to do on the magazine. I mean, I was never one of those straight you know, nuts and bolts reporters that just gave you the, the facts about a training routine or the diet of a yeah. particular guy. I mean, I wanted to give you the, bring the reader into the behind the scenes, give you a bit of the color and the context for what the guys were thinking and feeling and heading into contests and yeah. had, you know, what was going on backstage and in the hotel rooms as they prepped. And, you know, that, that that's something I took some pride in, in working on. And um, that kind of journalism was a little bit unusual for the time in those magazines. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, so, it's yeah, it's great that you were influenced by those great writers like Hunter S. Thompson and, you know, Norman Mailer and stuff, you know. Yeah, I didn't have the lifestyle of Hunter S. Thompson, but I <laughs> no. but I uh, but I certainly admired his work. And, yeah. and I know Rick yeah. did, too. Um, and what did you um, think when, you, when you met Arnold for the first time, because you're a bodybuilding fan like all of us were. So well, you, I was I was awestruck by right. Arnold. I mean, he now, of course, he had he had retired after the 75 uh, South Africa Olympia, his I think right. his fifth Olympia, and he was uh, at such a level above everyone else. I mean, I just saw him in such awe. Um, but he he was a really nice guy. He was like a big brother, you know. He was uh, he was a fun guy. He liked to play pranks. He he <laughs> liked to have fun. He was really a, a magnetic personality. And of course, he was branching out then from being just a bodybuilding guy to a, a, a young budding actor. He had just been in Stay Hungry. Yeah. And Pump and Iron, of course, was coming out, and um, and he was getting noticed beyond the bodybuilding world into the Hollywood celebrity world, right. and and uh, and I think uh, he was interested in me because I I my 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 interest in writing and literary things and that sort of thing, um, and he he hired me to um, uh, write his bodybuilding courses for his mail order courses. Oh, wow. Um, so I ghost wrote and designed all of those. I mean, he had a batch before, but I don't know who wrote his first batch, but I did a whole renewal of them. It was yeah. about 10 different booklets. And of course, that was a big source of revenue for him in those days. Yeah. You know, the mail order ads in the back of Weeders magazine. And, you know, there were a couple of guys that did it, but Arnold was the, really the pioneer of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I worked on that and he really liked what I did. And I spent a lot of time art directing them. Not that I'm really a designer, but I put that effort to work and um, he was really happy with it. And, you know, I used to go to his house all the time. And in those days, his, his interest in politics, it was a fledgling budding interest. Um, I remember one night, uh, Sunday evening, we watched the 76 presidential debate between okay. Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter together. Okay. And he, he was, he was, he was pulling for Ford. He was a young Republican in the making right. and um, you know, and we were really caught up in it. And so I got to see a, a side of Arnold that a lot of, you know, fans wouldn't have got to see. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Um, and he was really... That's, that's kind of my much. favorite um, time of Arnold's life. You know, I, I'm a big Arnold fan. I've read a ton of books about him, a ton of biographies about him. And I really like that period in Arnold's life between uh, when he retired from bodybuilding until he made it big in, in uh, acting. 
which was probably yeah. like a five year period. And he really wasn't well known by the general public, but it seemed like, you know, I, when I watch uh, interviews with him on like the tonight show on like 1978, 79, around that era, he's yeah. very articulate. He's very honest. Uh, it had to be a great, great period to know him in his life then, you know, before he became a really big star. Well, you had a sense that this was a guy who was going places, you know, he yeah. wasn't going to just be a retired bodybuilder. And um, he really w was eager to cultivate a presence in the, in the film scene. Mm -hmm. um, this is of course before Conan, which was his first big break. Right. Um, but he, but he was, you know, courting interest among the press. And I, I'll never forget one of the greatest weeks of my life. Thanks to Arnold's generosity it coincided around the 1976 Mr. America contest. That was probably the last time they, they called them Mr. Contest. You know, then they went yeah, to things yeah. like American bodybuilding championships and world bodybuilding championships because mm -hmm. Ben Weider wanted the, uh, bodybuilding to be considered for inclusion in the Olympics. And that sounded more like a sport than a Mr. Like a beauty pageant kind right. of attitude. Yeah. Um, so the Mr. America contest, that was the one won by Mike Menser in New York. Mm -hmm. um, it was the first time I'd ever been to New York. I was wide eyed with wonder at the skyscrapers and the whole scene. And, right. um, and, and Arnold and I sh actually shared a hotel room at Howard Johnson's in Times Square no kidding. For, that, wow. for that week. I know. I mean, he, he was pretty frugal in those days, as was I. And, um, <laughs> um, and uh, he was a judge at the contest. And of course, right. the contest was notable because it was the first time Mike Menser really burst onto the scene and everybody was in awe of him, this young, amazing talent with huge arms and a little bit, not the greatest poser in the world in those days, but, but, you know, a, you know, a young star in the making. And, um, but Arnold was also, he had set up a lot of, you know, interviews with various media outlets. And um, I remember at the, the night of the contest, Arnold, even though he was a judge, he left early from the evening show uh, because he was asked to be the date of Candace Bergen, Oh, as, wow. as, as her uh, kind of um, escort to the Saturday Night Live filming that no, was in yeah. the early days wow. of Saturday Night Live yeah. at NBC. And um, so Arnold sort of took off and went with Candace for that. <laughs> wow. And, you know, the show finished up and I interviewed Mike and a bunch of the other guys of the time. And um, I can't remember all the guys who did well in the various classes, but it was it was a great show. Yeah. And, wow. um, I was back at the hotel room. I was, you know, it was like midnight and I'm, I'm sitting in bed reading and suddenly the phone rings and it's, what are you doing? It's Arnold. And he says, you want to come to an after party and <laughs> get, get dressed and come down now. And so um, I got dressed. I, you know, I, I had just blue jeans and a T-shirt. You know, I was right. way undressed. And I went to this really swanky club called Park Avenue One Fifth which was kind of done up like an old uh, Titanic ocean liner. Oh, and um, it had like, you had to open a porthole to get in. Like, you know, they had to look at you through a porthole to right. let you in. <laughs> and I knocked on the door and they said, who are I? I said, I'm a guest of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I was going, they probably don't know who this guy is. And right. they know, oh yeah, Arnold, Arnold. And, you know, they, and suddenly Arnold was at the door and he ushered me in. And um, the first guy I met was Paul Simon of Simon and Garfunkel. Right. <laughs> and when he heard that I worked for Weeders magazine, like he was into fitness and he was into vitamins and nutrition and all of that stuff. He bored the tears off me. Like he, I, I, I couldn't get rid of the guy. He was going on and on for half an hour. Oh. He said, I got these terrible calcium deposits on my fingers because he, it affected his guitar playing. Uh -huh. And he said, what do I take? What do I take? Inositol or choline? Or what do I take for, for right. these calcium deposits? Because I, I didn't have the slightest idea, but I would sort of bluff my way along with it. Right. And uh, we had this half hour conversation. And then Arnold says, come and sit at the table. And it was just madness. It was just everyone was drunk and crazy. And <laughs> there was this giant table, a round table. And I'm sitting there and there's Arnold on one side of me. And I sense a presence on my right side. And this guy turns to me and says, oh, hello, Jack, how are you? And it's Jack Nicholson. No. And uh, yeah, it was Jack Nicholson sitting there. And he goes, oh, my name's Jack, too. And I said, yeah, I know. And he says, tell me, Jack, what have you been up to this summer? And I said, oh, well, I've just moved down from Canada and I'm working at the Weeder magazine explaining, you know, of course, he had no wasn't impressed in the least by that. And right. I said, what have you been doing this summer, Jack? And he says, I've been sitting on the back of a yacht reading scripts in the Mediterranean. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And I said, oh, well, that's the summer. Yeah. Um, but so, and then he said, have you met Mick? And I stand up and Mick Jagger is across oh, the man. table. He, he is absolutely shit-faced, pardon my language, <laughs> legless, like he's just hammered. Uh, and he could barely stand. He kind of extends his hand and he's wearing this uh, Robin's egg blue blazer, very striking jacket. I'll never forget it. And I shake his hand and I met Keith Richards and, you know, all the Rolling Stones were there. And, right, you know, right. and so, uh, you know, the night unfolded from there. It was just madness. And, and, yeah. um, was John you know, Lucky there and the guys from Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd. And, you know, it was yeah. a very early cast, John Belushi when he was still alive. And of course it was the night on Saturday Night Live that Joe Cocker had been the musical oh, guest. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and John Belushi did a great imitation of Joe yeah, Cocker. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that was pretty, it was a pretty special uh, moment for me, you know, just to yeah. be eyewitness to that. And on that same trip, I, we had lunch. Arnold, um, we went to uh, Elaine's, which was a, a very popular uh, Upper East Side uh, salon, you know, restaurant where a lot of celebrities would go, Woody Allen, guys like that. Right. We met Dustin Hoffman and Robert Town, who wrote the screenplay for Chinatown, guys like that. Right. And we met Andy Warhol, you know, the great pop artist. Right. And Andy invited Arnold, oh, you should come to the factory and do a, a lunch with us and do an interview for Interview Magazine. And Arnold didn't really know who Andy Warhol was. Hmm. And he asked me later, he said, you know, who is this Andy guy? He seems kind of weird. What should, should, should I go and meet him? Should I meet him? And um, I said, yeah, you're damn right. You should meet him. I mean, he's a, he's a legendary artist. He's a, a cultural icon. Right. Um, and, and I said, interview magazines also very influential for, for celebrity culture. Yeah. So Arnold, the next day, Arnold and I went together to the factory near wow. Union Square in New York. And I'll never forget that we walk into the, the lobby of, of the offices there and there's a Great Dane stuffed like a taxidermy, like a Great Dane, um, you know, just barely, it's just something you don't see every day. And um, we were ushered into this boardroom and there was an enormous moose head, like another stuffed animal, a moose head at the, at the head of the table where Andy sat and, uh, and they, they did this box lunch, these great, the best sandwiches I've ever had, tuna sandwiches. Uh, and in boxes and Andy, who hardly said two words, like his editor, Bob Gucci, not Gucci, only Bob Colicello, um, inter did most of the questions for the interview. And Arnold was very charming and everyone really took Arnold because he had such a magnetic personality. Right. And, uh, and then after the interview, um, Andy himself took Arnold and I behind the scenes to the factory where he makes all his famous silkscreen paintings you know, various celebrities and stuff that are worth millions today. And, right. um, you know, he showed us the process, which I found really interesting. And, um, you know, that was another great glimpse into a world that I never would have had access yeah. to if it wasn't for Arnold's kindness, you know, and said, including me and all of that. Right, right. Wow. Amazing. We, we, I also met Douglas Kent Hall on that trip who wrote Arnold's first book. Mm hmm. Uh, the biography of Arnold, um, right. the education of a bodybuilder. I'm sure you read it as a kid. And yeah, um, yeah, and Douglas was a wonderful guy. He was very big in the rodeo world. Mm -hmm. Had written books about rodeo, uh, you know, um, culture. And um, you know, and he and I hit it off. And I used to see him at the occasional concert, uh, the concert contests. After that, mm -hmm. um, and uh, lovely man, lovely guy. Wow, what an amazing week! That's great. You'll never forget oh. that week for the rest of your life. Yeah, I really will. It's crazy. Yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> so um, what was the first big show you went to, Jack? Was it that uh, 76 America, that one you're talking about? Um, yeah, I, 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 it was either that. Actually, the first big show I went to, it was in Vancouver, Canada. I was down in Los Angeles then. It, it was in July, really the first month or so of me being down there. Okay. And Arnold was a guest poser. Um, he wasn't in great shape, but he was, it was at the Mr. North America. Um, and I can't remember who won it. Like Darcy Beckles was in it and yeah. you know, a couple of guys. And I, Joe flew me up for that. And uh, Arnold and I, that's when I really got to know Arnold. We went to a party and got into all kinds of trouble and had some fun and everything. <laughs> um, um, but uh, yeah, that was one of the first contests, but I guess the first really major contest was the America. Mm -hmm. That mentor one. And, uh, and of course, Mike and I went on to become really good friends after that over the yeah, years. Um, you know, and uh, 
um, you know, we can get into Mike a little bit later, but uh, yeah, that, that was probably the first big contest. The first, the, the first contest that really blew me away for the scale of it and the drama and the noise and was the 76 Olympia okay. in Columbus, Ohio, the one that Franco won his yeah. first. Um, it was the first time that Arnold and Jim Lorimer, his co-promoter, staged in Columbus. They went on to do a number of those, of course. Yeah. Um, Jim Lorimer was a wonderful man, like a very prominent business leader in, in Columbus and uh, just a really lovely guy. He had us into his home and really generous with his time. And, yeah. Um, it was Arnold's first kind of foray into promoting. Yeah. And of course, you know, he's turned that into a huge enterprise now. But um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I was just blown away by it. I mean, the moment that just shook me uh, was so dramatic was Ed Corney's performance. Yeah. Um, now, you know, Ed didn't have the great, he had a fantastic physique. I mean, I think he, his physique was overlooked how good it was mm -hmm. because he was such a stellar uh, poser. Mm -hmm. I mean, he just brought the house down. I mean, the whole place shook. I thought the balcony was going to collapse. Wow, it was that loud. Crazy. Yeah. Um, and Franco won and Frank Zane, of course, was there and uh, Ken Waller and, you know, a lot of the guys at the time. It was really I'd never seen anything on that scale. Wow. Um, really dramatic. Just the way it was staged and just the, the atmosphere and everything. Right. Yeah. 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 And it just the, the noise of the fans. I mean, right. I, I tell you, you know, as I said, bodybuilding those days was a smaller world. But boy, were the fans into it. I mean, right. Right. You know, there's nothing. That, you know, once you get bitten by the iron bug you become such a zealot yeah. um, and it's exhibited by the, 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 the vocal nature of the fans way in ways that football or baseball or basketball fans don't show, um, you know, and, and it, there's just something special about a big bodybuilding crowd. Yeah. Yeah. I talked to um, uh, Roger Schwab and Roger was a judge back then. And uh, he yes. made a good point. He said that the bodybuilding audiences back then were very knowledgeable and they really knew their sport and, you know, they were very passionate about it. And I went to the, my first Olympia was the year after that one in 77. So I, I know what you mean about the noise. It was just incredible. It was amazing. It was just, the people were standing on their feet screaming. You don't see oh. anything like that today. It's just, it, had, yeah. it was a special world back then. Yeah. Now I, I haven't really been to a contest in many years, so I don't know what it's like today. I, of course, with the pandemic, it's compromised everything, but we'll, we'll get back to a normal life soon enough. Yeah, but yeah. Um, are the fans e as equally as enthusiastic now? Or no, what's it not like? at all. I mean, not at all. You don't see that kind of pandemonium anymore. And um, it, it, now they have all these different divisions too, so it's kind of watered down. You know, you've got bikini, you've got fitness, you've got men's physique, and it's just it's a marathon right. show. You know, it's not well, back then. We just had men's bodybuilding, and that was it. So yeah, well, and of course, you know, it, as both of us had grown up reading the magazine. I remember uh, reading about when it was at the Brooklyn Academy of Music for Larry Scott's yeah. 1965 when the first Olympia and just how mad that was. The crowd was insane. Yeah. And I, I never quite understood what uh, um, the reports meant until I saw the 76 Olympia. And I said, oh, now I know what they mean. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so what was it like? Uh, tell me a little bit more about hanging out with Arnold because he's such an icon now, and he's you know was one of the world's biggest movie stars ever. But you knew him before all that, so uh, I heard. You know, well, I, I mean, I'll I'll, re I'll I'll relay one story I remember vividly. I don't know if this will get me in trouble or not um, <laughs> for telling it, but you know, here goes. Um, <laughs> on that trip to Vancouver for the Mister North America, uh, Arnold and I had been at a party the night before and we were flying out on the Sunday morning back to Los Angeles okay. from Vancouver. And I don't know why, but Arnold had my airplane ticket. He was wearing a blazer, a Navy blazer for the flight. And he had my airplane ticket, my return ticket um, um, in his breast pocket. And um, we were seatmates and we flew from Vancouver to um, in those days, he had to stop off in San Francisco and change planes and carry on the rest of the way okay. for the last leg. And um, somehow Arnold and I got separated in the airport and he had my return ticket for the last leg in his pocket. Okay. And I couldn't get on the plane. I didn't, I, I had nothing. I had, I didn't have a, even a credit card in those days. You know, yeah, I'm yeah. 21 years old. Um, I had a couple of quarters in my pocket and um, Arnold takes off on the plane without me with my ticket. 
Oh, and I have no way of getting back home to Los Angeles. Oh, and, yeah. and, and I had parked my car in front of his house um, a couple of days before that. And we drove together to the airport to LAX. And um, so I needed to get to his place and get to my car and get home and then report to work the yeah. next day at Weeder. And, um, um, you know, so I wait. I said, oh, God, so Arnold's got my plane ticket. I went to the it was PSA Airlines. It used to exist in those days. And I went up to the desk and I said, look, you know, my friend Arnold, he, they didn't have any idea who Arnold was. And I said, you've got my ticket. I have no way of getting back. Is there, you know, is, I don't know. I was trying to find a way to get onto a plane. And of course, I had no cash. And uh, Arnold, um, um, he, his routine in those days was he would go to the Venice Beach on Sunday afternoons. Okay. And sort of suntan and hang out with the guys and gossip and just sort of be, you know, just the guys getting together on the beach. It was a, a big deal and part of bodybuilding culture at that time. And so Arnold went from landing at the airport to LX straight to the beach. He never went home. And okay. I'm calling his house. I, I, I got my one quarter and I'm calling his house. <laughs> and I keep getting his mother. His mother was visiting from Austria. She didn't speak any English. And I didn't speak any German. And I'm trying to communicate with her. Where's Arnold? Where's Arnold? And I met her actually a few days before. And I don't know if she knew who I was, but I was trying to acquaint her. You know, yeah. I don't know if you remember me kind of thing. But, um, you know, so that didn't go very far. And then I figured out he must have gone to the beach. And, and there was this course. This is before cell phones. Right. right. Um, way before, you know, and, um, you know, it was pay phones in those days. Right. So I'm hanging out in the San Francisco airport for hours on end. I'm being harassed by Hari Krishnas and, you know, just, you know, the whole thing. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. And I finally, uh, about six o'clock that evening, Arnold comes home from the beach and I get him at home. And um, he said, where are you? What's, uh, you know, like, it's my fault. He sort of yelling at me, like, I, where was I, you know? I said, you've got my ticket, you know, and uh, oh, oh, so I, I said, is there any way you can get to the airport or call the air airline and get wire another ticket to, you know, get me on the next plane? So he takes care of that. And I said, also, can you pick me up? Because um, I didn't even have fare for the taxi to his place yeah. in Santa Monica then. And so he picks me up in his incredible car. He used to drive these big 6.9 liter engine Mercedes. It was a silver tank of a car. Yeah. Uh, he used to keep it immaculate. And um, Arnold picked me up. It's like 8.30 at night. It's dark out. Um, and um, he, he's got a friend with him. Bernd Zimmerman was his name. It was a guy who ran a chain of studios, health studios in Austria and Germany. That was a karate guy. Mm -hmm. And um, really nice guy. He looked like George Papard, the actor. Okay. And he was in the A-team. And uh, so Arnold was driving. Uh, um, Barrett was in the front right passenger seat. I'm sitting directly behind Arnold. And we're starting to drive uh, towards Marina del Rey. And running along the northern boundary of LAX is an east-west road. I forget what the name of the road is that leads you into Marina del Rey. And we're taking this road. It's a really dark. There's no other traffic around us. Dead quiet. Um, and suddenly Arnold swerves the car over to the side of the road. And he says something in German to Berndt. And they have this sort of agreement or something. And suddenly the car pulls over and Arnold opens his driver's side door. And I see that he's pulled into view a 357 Magnum pistol. Um, you know, I go, my God, what the hell is, I thought they're going to shoot me or something. <laughs> And, and Arnold stands up and he puts his gun out into the night sky and shoots off four rounds into the sky, like directly above, like right by the airport. He wasn't trying to hit an airplane. Let me be clear on that. <laughs> he, was, he was just, he, I think he had just bought this new gun and he was like a kid. He really wanted to let it go. <laughs> and, and so he fires the gun and I see these giants, like a cannon going off, these giant sparks shooting up into the night sky. And I'm thinking, my God, and Barrett's laughing and he's Arnold's laughing. And suddenly he gets in and puts the, the brings the hides the gun under his seat and zooms off uh, <laughs> like a getaway. And, and uh, we go home. And that was the end of that night. You know? <laughs> I thought, I'll, and I've told that story to friends and no one's ever believed me. And I don't right. I hope Arnold doesn't sue me for that. But it's the God's truth. That's what I witnessed it with my own eyes. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. <laughs> but that's the kind of guy he was. He was a prankster. He liked to have a good time. Right. He had to be so much fun to hang out with. And he spent the whole yeah. week with him in that hotel room. That had to be crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, he was great. Wow. Did he ever uh, hook up with Candace Bergen, or was it, that just like a publicity stunt date thing? Um, I, I'm not aware of any romance that came from that. Uh, yeah. They had the one date. I, I mean, I'm sure they maintained a friendship. Um, but it was, it was, you know, a couple of years later that Maria Shriver kind of became the great love interest in Arnold's life. Yeah. Uh, a, a lovely, gracious woman who I'd met a, a couple of times. And, you know, Arnold was very just enthralled by her. And, um, you yeah. know, yeah, she was a beautiful woman, but also she represented a, a political dynasty in the Kennedys. And I think yeah. Arnold hugely interested in all of that because he he harbored political ambitions, although he never necessarily articulated them then. Uh, you could tell that was something that he was kind of, you know, getting into the lane to follow yeah. towards. Yeah. I remember he did an interview, I think it was in 1979, and uh, the reporter said that Arnold said his ideal woman was Candace Bergen because she was beautiful, she was smart, you know, she, was, uh, she had a great personality, and then that's all the qualities he was looking for in a woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was really a lovely woman. Yeah. Um, so I, but I, I never really, he never really talked about her too much to me after that, but um, I never saw her at the after party. So maybe, uh, maybe she got tired of being with Arnold and <laughs> took off. I don't, yeah. I don't know, but there was a lot of other big names there that night. Oh yeah. Wow. Amazing. Uh, so tell me a little bit about Mike Menser, because uh, you met him in 1976 when he won the America and you said that was the year he kind of came out. And then he was the big bodybuilding hit. And then he, of course, became very famous because he was talking about the low volume type of training that he did, which nobody else was doing at the time. So uh, you, you developed a friendship with Mike, huh? Yeah, uh, Mike, um, we actually shared an apartment for a short time uh, together. Oh, really? Um, what, my, Joe, Betty Weeder, Joe's wife, uh, had a very old aunt. Anne Rosemer was her name, lovely old woman, okay. who had a small scale apartment complex uh, on Beverly Glen in, in West Los Angeles. And a couple of the apartments in the back, like Anne lived in the front unit and there were three other units behind. Um, and I used to rent one of them from her. Uh, Joe kind of found digs for me uh, mm -hmm. in those days. And, and um, he put up um, Mike and Kathy Gelfo, his girlfriend at the time, um, there. And, and I actually was uh, out, of, uh, out of a home for a short time, ended up staying with them. Uh, for a few weeks and got to know them really well. And of course, I became a huge fan of Mike and, um, you know, became a devotee of, of the high, you know, heavy duty, high intensity training, um, which of course was the antithesis of the kind of training uh, I was writing about in Arnold's bodybuilding courses, you know, yeah. many, many sets, lots of reps, hours of training in the gym each day. And right. I ended up, uh, just as an aside, I ended up writing uh, quite quite a few other bodybuilder bodybuilders, mail order courses for them as a ghostwriter, like Roger yeah. Callard, Robbie Robinson, Pete Grimkowski, Bill Grant, guys like that. Okay. Uh, they would hire me to write that stuff. And they all basically did the same thing, you know. Yeah. And then along came Mike, who kind of came from the school of Nautilus, Arthur Jones, mm -hmm. um, who Mike used to rave about as a genius, a re really like an interesting guy. And, um, um, you know, made a lot of sense what Mike talked about. Um, but of course, it ruffled a lot of feathers, you know, because yeah. basically Mike and Mike wasn't afraid of voicing his opinion. You know, he would say, you know, the, the kind of training Arnold and guys like that are doing is, is counterproductive. It's it's a waste of time and you could do so much more with less. Um, and, and of course, Mike spawned a huge following. Guys like Dorian Yates followed in his footsteps yeah. and Casey Vietor, guys like that, who was an Arthur Jones guy as well. Right. Um, um, so yeah, and I, I I helped Mike a little bit. Mike was a good, but Mike was a pretty good writer in his own stead. Like he mm -hmm. actually wrote all his articles for Weeder. Whereas what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of the articles written in Joe's magazines that were under the byline of a bodybuilder were actually written by one of us. Yeah, um, you know, Armand Tanny used to write a lot of the articles for Joe, as as a, you know, name your bodybuilder. You know, um, and um, but Mike would write his own articles. He was one of the few, Rick Wayne also being an exception. And um, um, so, you know, Mike ended up moving out west to Los Angeles and we became very good friends. Um, I also, you know, it's funny, it's funny because I, what, the nature of the writing I like to do, which is getting behind the scenes and into the personalities of the guys versus just the mechanical nuts and bolts. 
Um, I, I, in some ways, one of my regrets years later looking back is I almost became too close to some of the bodybuilders. Mm. Um, and I think in some ways it kind of hampered my journalistic integrity and my neutrality, mm. which is something you really have to watch. And uh, I became really caught up in the Menser scene and uh, uh, was really you know, enthralled. In fact, I remember at the 1977 uh, World Championships, which was, were in the south of France, Nîmes, France. Right. Everyone was touting Mike to be the big winner, and I was certain he was going to win. Everyone was certain he was going to win. Right. But along came this guy, Cal Scholick, right. who was phenomenal. And I met Cal. Um, he, he had just come out from, I think, Delaware or Rhode Island, one of those smaller states on the East Coast, uh, and lived out West. And I got to know him a little bit, interviewing him, and Joe liked him. And um, uh, but, but Cal came in and just blew Mike away that day. Mm -hmm. Mike, Mike's timing was off. He wasn't in the best shape. Uh, and Cal, of course, you know, Cal did a lot with, he didn't have the greatest legs, greatest calves, but he, he had such phenomenal arms and chest that it would overpower everyone else. And, right. uh, and it was a real shocker. And I, I remember thinking, man, I, you know, I, I didn't see that coming and I should have. Yeah. As, uh, um, so, you know, it's one of my regrets years later that I don't regret the friendship that I had with Mike Nesser. He was a really dear and lovely man. Yeah. Um, but I feel in some ways it compromised my reporting a little bit, you know. Yeah. Did you did you write the article differently when you covered it, Jack? Uh, uh, four months or more than Cal? No, I mean, I think I mean, I remember um, Cal telling me he was really happy with the, the, the article, the, the okay. report I did and how fair and balanced it was. So, yeah. I, you know, I tried to try to be balanced, but um I, I, you know, sometimes I would find myself falling into the fan club of a particular guy. Yeah. I was really close with Robbie Robinson as well. He was a wonderful guy. I used to spend a lot of time with him. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll tell you one story your listeners may want to hear about it. I, I witnessed the famous Cal Scholic incident with Joe Weider. Oh, yeah. Where, yeah. They, where they butted heads. Okay. Um, it, 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 it was a crazy moment. Um, so Cal... Um, I can't remember if this, well, I guess this would have been after the 77 uh, universe, you know, world championships. Cal yeah, won I was going to ask if it was before the seven, the 78 Olympia when he did the uh, crucifix. Yeah. The famous crucifix yeah. was just leading up to the 78 Olympia. Okay. And, you know, Cal, he was a really nice guy, uh, had a lovely wife who was from the um, Dutch Indonesian islands, Malacca. Right. Um, and uh, really lovely guy, really strong. And I used to, I interviewed him a number of times. And we became pretty friendly. Uh, but Cal was a very straight, real straight shooter. He's kind of a no nonsense straight shooter. Mm -hmm. uh, he was very honest, very unvarnished. Um, and, you know, Joe was a guy, Joe liked to be liked. And Joe would like to make promises he never tended to keep. Mm -hmm. You know, he, in fact, he even told me, and I was nothing in terms of uh, like being a bodybuilder. I mean, I used to train as a power lifter. I was really into lifting, but was never anything to write home about. Mm -hmm. um, but Joe would say, yeah, if you keep up the training, I'm going to give you $50,000 and put you on the cover of the magazine. <laughs> and, and, and I think he's saying this to me, you know, and I go, oh, come on, Joe. Um, um, so, you know, he would make promises. And I guess he'd made a few promises to Cal that were not, as far as Cal was concerned, were not coming true. I don't know what they were, and I wasn't privy to those conversations. But I think Cal's nose was out of joint because, you know, I think he felt like Joe was saying all this stuff and, and the stuff wasn't forthcoming, whatever that was. Yeah. And, um, and I remember it was, it was in the winter. It was a rainy day. It was quite quiet. Uh, Joe, you know, Joe had a couple offices in the editorial part of the Weeder and Health and Fitness Building. Um, he had his big office. It was all mahogany paneled in a huge boardroom. And those places were like the inner sanctum. They were like museums. He would had all this artwork and he had one of the first revolutionary flags of the American revolution framed, you know, it's, it's a priceless artifact. Yeah. Uh, he had beautiful Frederick Remington bronze statues of Western life, like the cowboys and Indians and all that and Buffalo and all that kind of stuff, right, right, stuff that's worth a fortune. And um, but where Joe spent most of his time was at a little table in the center of the art studio, in the design studio where the art directors would work in terms of putting the get together the magazine every month. You know, they would these are the art directors that designed the pages and laid out the, the photographs and all that stuff, you know, kind of the nerve center 
mm-hmm. of the operation. And Joe used to sit there and hold court and he would spend, he used to put a loop in his eye and he'd look at these contact sheets. This is the days before digital, yeah. of course. And he would look at negatives and he would, he would, he had, I'll say one thing about Joe. He, he was, wasn't just a great bodybuilding fan. He was a great publisher. He really loved publishing and he knew it. And he, and he knew how to turn out a good magazine. He, had, he always made a good product and he had a, many years of that under his belt. And he had a good eye for good photography and he used to drive Artie Zeller nuts and guys like that. But, but he would circle on the, on the contacts and the negatives. This is a good one. Crop it here, crop it there. He would direct the art directors and how to make the stuff look even better. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so Joe would spend a lot of time sitting there in the kind of the nerve center in full view of everyone. It was all these glass enclosed offices and, um, you know, Cal came in through the back door. You, normally, uh, someone coming in from the street would come in through the front reception, let the receptionist know I'm here to see Mr. Weeder, etc. But Cal knew there was a side door that led into the warehouse. Mm-hmm. And then there was a big metal staircase that went up into the back side of the editorial offices. So he could come in and bypass the reception. So one day, Cal, Scala, he's wearing a, like an Adidas track suit, you know, zip, z- z- zip top suit. And he comes storming in and he's got a head, he's red faced and angry. And he started yelling at Joe. Like they had a few words like, like you're not keeping your promises, that sort of thing. Yeah. I'm there yeah. with Joe. I'm witnessing this whole thing. And then Cal made a beeline into the, this little room adjacent, which was the photo library. And it wasn't a very sophisticated place. It was just a bunch of filing cabinets stuffed with prints of, of photos that had run out in Joe's magazines over the years and they were all broken down by bodybuilder alphabetically okay and so Cal scoops up all the s's like his stuff as well as every all the arnold photos yeah, and a bunch right, of other right. magazine photos and the rick wayne photos Jeez. and he's got like, just armfuls of photos like i'm talking about thousands of photos in his wow. arms yeah. bursting out and he comes running back through the studio to make a getaway and Joe says, you're not getting away with those. And, and Joe, oh, I got to give Joe credit. You know, he, he was a 57-year-old guy. He lifted weights a bit, but he was nothing like Cal Scholick in terms of formidable physique. Right. And, and he stood right there and stood his ground. And Cal ran into him like a rhino charging and just, bam, hit him. Like sent Joe flying, sent, oh a, bunch of, sent a bunch of the photos flying across the room. But Joe, Cal quickly scooped up the ones on the floor and he grabbed his armfuls and then went down the back stairs again and got in his car and zoomed it off. Wow. And, and he made off with all these photos. Like, I'm oh, taking them. Wow. And, okay. and of course, Joe was apoplectic. He was beside himself, um, you know, like, call the cops, call the cops, this robbery, you know, the whole thing, you know, right. quite dramatic. Right. And, um, and of course, Joe had his lawyers and there was lawyers involved. And a few days go by and kind of heads cool. And um, I got word from Cal, you can meet me in the parking lot of the Santa Monica airport and I'll hand over the photos to you. <laughs> and so I, I drive my old Volvo in there. He's got his Camaro or whatever he was driving then. And uh, it was like this like clandestine drug deal. You know, he, he hands over these photos to me and they're all bent and wrinkled and stuff from the oh, violence. Man. And um, I take them back to Joe the next day and they, they pursued a lawsuit. I, I never quite knew how it was resolved, but I think Joe ended up having to pay Cal some money and to make him go away. But uh, wow. Wow. yeah, that was a pretty memorable day, I must say. <laughs> yeah, I, ne- I always heard rumors about that story, but I never talked to anybody who was there. So that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bodybuilding Heroes and Legends, Volume 1 by John Hansen is the book that celebrates the golden age of bodybuilding. This was the era in which legends such as Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sergio Oliva, Frank Zane, Robbie Robinson, Cal Skalak, and Mike Menser battled it out on stage for the biggest titles in bodybuilding. Read about some of the most exciting competitions that took place in the 1970s 
including the Oliva Schwarzenegger battles, Zane's first Olympia victory, and Scalak's controversial Mr. Olympia appearance, and much more. Filled with inspiring images of some of the greatest bodybuilders in the history of the sport, Bodybuilding Heroes and Legends Volume 1 is now available on Amazon.com or email John directly at naturalolympia at gmail.com.